Okay, uh, great. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. And uh, I guess it's sad that Eugene Gomery I can't be here. Um, I don't know about as much about him as he does, but I'm going to try and contextualize his work um, from my perspective. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully there'll be some uh, interesting insights and differences to that potential talk that I guess never happened or might ha happen elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> uh, I wanted to start with this quote, um, which uh, Gomringer wrote in 1954 in his sort of manifesto or, or, or critical essay um, from, li from Line to Constellation. Um, <clears throat> I can read it out. Our languages are on the road to formal simplification. Abbreviated, restricted forms of language are emerging. The content of a sentence is often conveyed in a single word. Longer statements are often represented by small groups of letters. Moreover, there is a tendency among languages for the many to be replaced by a few, which are generally valid. Does this restricted and simplified use of language and writing mean the end of poetry? Certainly not. Um, <clears throat> eviscerating statement. Um, in lots of ways, um, I felt like this claim uh, resonates in a very uh, simple um, sort of like New York Times opinion, Guardian opinion um, rhetoric about the uh, situation of language in um, the internet moment um, in terms of being simplified, being condensed into short tweet-like form and um, even disappearing into uh, image form as emoji or emoticon. Um, so, so I thought that this, uh, this is an interesting point to start because it shows that this isn't, of course, a brand new phenomenon. It's been happening and it's been worried about and it's been contested for a long time. And um, it was certainly a concern amongst Gomringer, uh, Gomringer's generation. Um, being one of the originators of concrete poetry, it should be noted that he didn't necessarily, um, especially at first, call it concrete poetry. His um, term for it was uh, constellation, uh, con the constellation or constellations. His first book of what is now recognized as concrete poetry is called uh, Constellations in English, um, the same word in German, which I can't pronounce. Um, <clears throat> And I guess I'm going to riff on that idea of the constellation. Uh, okay, so, oh, here we go. Uh, this is his poem, Wind, in 1953. Um, assuming that some people here don't know anything about his work, I thought it was a good place to start with uh, an illustration or a, a representation of it. Um, so I guess the most important thing to note here is that um, the, sh the, the shape, uh, the, the placement of the letters on the page is integral to the poem's meaning, um, which is one of the key tenets of um, concrete poetry. Um, and as a result, um, you have to read it uh, in a sort of multilinear, multidirectional way to fully, fully understand um, the, what, what is happening in the poem. Um, and to jump to today, I wanted to first roll through a few examples of uh, contemporary poets' work that might or might not have uh, similarities to uh, Gomringer's work in the 50s and onwards. Um, well, this isn't actually poetry. This is just a tag cloud, which I pulled from searching for tag cloud. It was uploaded to Flickr by a Flickr user, he or she or they took um, terms from their Twitter. Um, and of course, you can immediately pull a comparison, you can immediately draw a comparison to the activity and the sort of um, indexicality of the concrete poem, um, whether or whether or not is, uh, a, a tag cloud is a concrete poem, I think is potentially an interesting question, um, but it's probably not. Um, Okay, so uh, the poet Sophia Lefraga, um, this is one work that she produced or published last year, 2014. Um, 
it is it takes the script of Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett and she performs it um, within the iMessage um, interface in uh, a very condensed or, or, or she condenses the language into sort of text speak. Um, so you can see on the uh, on the right hand side a performance of her performing at Harvard University um, and then the left hand side is just a still from the video. So it's a, it's a poem that's published as a video that can be performed live um, and that the visuality of the iPhone interface, I think, is uh, and, and the text speak that it's um, communicated in is, I think, integral to how the poem functions. Um, this is an image macro by Michael Hessel Meal, um, who's based in Atlanta. Um, a macro within the poetry uh, poetry sense is a poem that is an image, or it's an image with text overlaid, to be more precise. Um, uh, here's a work by Ian Hatcher. Um, this is a screenshot of it. It really doesn't work unless you open it in the browser. Um, so bear with the internet as this loads. Could be slow. Here we go. And if I scroll over, this inverted effect occurs. Um, so this is a poem that's probably impossible to understand, or, or, or that couldn't function on the printed page. That would be uh, difficult for me to describe to you, uh, I think, effectively just through describing the poem, how the poem functions. Um, and it's difficult to read, I think. Um, or, or difficult to read in a linear fashion. It's easy to pick out words, but um, I'm not sure anyone, or anyone is able to read it uh, word by word. Um, uh, this is um, to further complicate the sort of definition of how this poem works and where. This is um, by a writer called Di Ashley, a writer and artist, that is, um, I find evocative because it's just published as a video. Uh, this one. Every time you are near, just like me, they long to be close to you. Why do stars fall down from the sky? Every time you walk by, just like me. They long to be close to you On the day that you were born The angels got together And decided to create a dream come true So they sprinkled moon dust in your hair Of gold and starlight in your eyes of blue That is why Oh, the oh, yeah, in the interest of time, we won't play it all. But it's important to note that this work really functions with this uh, poem, poem here that sort of describes both videos that they made and videos that they haven't made, their potential videos. Um, so the sort of the text and the video are very uh, are, are, are functioning in operation with each other. And there's like a very strong dialogue going on, and it's impossible to read the text without the video and the video without the text. I think to the to the uh, author's intention, um, although of course you could read them individually. So I think there's an, an interesting dialogue there happening. Um, 
I wonder. Okay, this is an app uh, by Amara, Amaranth Borsuk, Kate Durban, and Ian Hatcher called Abra, a living text. And this is quite hard to describe also. I mean, the, basically the only way you can read this is by downloading it as an app on your iPhone or iPad. Um, but they loaded this text that they wrote into this app and they designed it so that there's these options at the top which do things like reconfigure the text or like make words disappear or make words move around. So that they are really investigating the interactivity of text. Um, and through the screenshots, you can kind of get a sense of an immediate introduction to how this works. But there's a lot of color and magic and other things happening in this work. <clears throat> um, Alejandro Miguel Justino Crawford um, has published poetry that is uh, 3D virtual worlds. Um, so you really to read the poem, you have to play the, the um, walk through the world. Um, Juliana Huxtable, who has um, produced, uh, or, or I don't know if you would call it published or, or, or exhibited these poems or fragments of longer poems as, um, as these uh, imagistic artworks and also um, reads them or this is a uh, MoMA performance on the right where she um, read her work with accompaniment, video and musical accompaniment. Um, and lastly, Penny Goring, whose practice is multifarious and very diverse. Um, but to give a little jump into this, this is a, um, a New Hive work she made on the site newhive.com, which is like an interactive not interactive, sorry, an animated sort of um, poem. Okay, so that was a quick snapshot of a number of works and experiments from today. And I guess um, how do, how, how do, how do Gomringer's works, how do his poems, relate to uh, these works that um, we just looked at now. Um, I suppose uh, there's lots to be drawn on. You could speak at length about why concrete po how concrete poetry works, why it's poetry, what it's doing. So um, by necessity, I'm gonna be very brief in my discussion of it today. But I'd say the, um, one of the most important things about the work is that they can really only be read if you read them in multiple directions. Um, or they're really poems that are most effective when they're read in multiple directions. So you can read this ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. But you could also read it pong, pong, ping, ping, pong, 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 pong. And only by reading it um, do you get the meaning of the poem and the the effect of the poem, which is to come out of the the son the, the sounds of the the ping pong game. Um, so uh, Gomringer and other concrete poets are very interested in the mechanics of play uh, within reading, and their idea for the constellation was if they reduced language to the most simple and fewest um, words or characters or signs possible, they set this small field or constellation. With it within which the reader could play by reading. So then I can play by going pong, 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 which is gonna render language onomatopoeic and nonsensical. Um, and that's uh, my sort of emancipatory reading of the poem, in a sense. Um, here's another work which um, elucidates the sort of sense of typography and shape on the page. Um, and I think to pull back to the question of technology, this is work that is really produced or maybe the sort of most of sort of um, characteristic uh, kind of poetry that can come out of the typewriter in a way um, because it's really exploring words as this imagistic shape on the page. 
So it's, what, it's, it's the poem made into an image. Um, here now, um, this is also multi-directional, imagistic, uh, and the poem doesn't really, you know, this, is, this wouldn't work so well if, the, um, if it wasn't in the shape and if arguably if it wasn't in this type, uh, the, the font, the typeface. Um, so, so it's work that really takes into these the, uh, things such as the, the, the spacing of the words, their shape, their type as, as material aspects of the poem and as um, necessary to the poem's meaning. Um, even immediately, oh, this is like a really funny one if you speak German. Um, it, if, if, even, uh, what was my point? Um, oh, so the, the, what, what they're calling to is the materiality of, I think, um, text that is often uh, bypassed in this sort of idealistic, romantic idea of poetry as like, um, just syntax and not, not necessary stuff, something that's materialized on the page. So there's like a strong sense of materialism there. Um, and here's the most famous one. And I think it's interesting to note in this context that he was living and working in Switzerland, even though he was born in Bolivia. Um, <clears throat> Switzerland in this period in the 50s um, was seen by these poets as a quite, um, a, a, a very, politically freeing country because it's a, a, tri, a, a essentially trilingual country. There's, um, whereas at this post-war moment, there was a lot of uh, solidification of borders through uh, the Iron Curtain and the Cold War and sort of these fallouts after the World War. Um, they saw this simplification of language and condensing of language as a way to break borders and to work towards some sort of universal language, whether or not we want to like believe in a universal language to such an extent today, I'm not sure. Whether or not the internet can be a universal language is also a question that um, is not worth ignoring, but possibly also not gonna result in a very um, conclusive answer. Um, and I think this is also an interesting example because it works in different languages. Um, wh whether or not it works differently in different languages, I'm not sure as I don't speak the different languages well enough. But I think that's also somehow part of how this poetry is functioning and how they envisaged it as a political um, machine or machinery, I suppose. Um, there it is on a wall. Um, and lastly, or, or, or one more point, they were taking up the rhetorics and the simplicity of advertising. Um, so in, in, in a way, they're also speaking a language of globalism, a globalism that's informed by United States kind of uh, post-war uh, consumerist propaganda and in a sense trying to um, disrupt it and um, break it a bit. Um, this one's really funny, this polo one, because this to me is sort of this weirdly um, secret concrete poem happening in it where the polos um, turn into letters that are this delighted consumer's gasp of happiness or something. Lucky strike. Um, so I, I think um, to start to try and tie these together, I, th I think that if we, if, if we look at concrete poetry and Gomringer's work and tie it to work in the present day, I think actually there's like quite um, a rich history of ma materialism within poetry and poetics that function through um, things that are sort of beyond what we think of normally as language or words or syntax, uh, which is the sort of the material and the technology of publishing um, essentially. Uh, this is to tie it to um, post-digital cultures, which of course we are in right now. Um, this is a uh, collection of works I was invited to put together for their website earlier this year. And this is looking at um, digital poetries of the 1990s as a moment where the infrastructure of the poem was really called into account and to account for its meaning. Um, so. Uh, you can explore that more on the website, I guess, because this is just a, a screenshot of of images that aren't the poems. But uh, another screenshot, this is one by Eduardo Kack, which was first done in 85, although translated through the 90s, four different uh, formats and technology. 
And with your mouse, you can drag this 3D concrete, essentially, poem in 360 degrees to elucidate its meaning. Um, Mendy and Keith Obadiki, this is, has um, pop-ups that come with language, um, but you put, the, wouldn't make sense so much if you just read the words. So they're engaging with the functionality of the browser and the materiality of the, the digital technology that's published with. Um, and I think there's lots of divergent counter histories alongside this. Um, Hanno uh, Weiner, who um, claimed, who uh, created a sort of clairvoyant poetry in New York in the 70s, where she sort of thought of words very imagistically, and she sort of claimed that she saw words around her as she, as she moved around her day-to-day -day life in the city. But out of this, created like a clair, a clair poetics, which was sort of this idea of poetry being able to access, or language when visualized being able to access um, like uh, intellectual material like beyond even the senses, the, you know, the clairvoyant. Um, and there's, of course, jumping further back in history, um, experiments of the early modernists like Malamé who experimented with typefaces and um, in his famous in coup de day, jamais na bolia le hazard, um, a throw of the dice doesn't abolish uh, chance. Um, so, yeah, and there's the computer poems, the 80s. Um, so I guess my main claim for the poetries that we saw, um, that I showed you at the start, which is sort of this trend in people's writing today, is that if we think of Gomringer's work and think of how it needs to be read in this multi-directional way, um, to gather its meaning. I'd say that the work that's being produced today, which is native to like uh, an iPhone or a, a, a desktop or a code, the, the, act, the act of reading has to go beyond just the text that's right in front of you. You have to read across media. Um, you have to be able to read how the text functions within the interface, how maybe the interface functions within a greater system and, and so I think that action, and I think that form of reading happens, or, or, or there's a certain playfulness in it, a play on the behalf of the reader um, that happens in lots of different directions. And in that sense, I think a lot of this work today could be thought of as this expanded concrete poetry or post-concrete poetry, or, or, or concrete poetry, if not being the same thing, can at least give us certain tools of how to read it and how to understand its critical function. Um, I was quite interested in the ideas of decoupling that we heard earlier, and I was wondering if maybe this sort of reading across media could be a form of decoupling media, which is, I think is especially relevant when we're situating it within the interface of the iPhone and iMessage, which is probably a bad technology um, to like fall on one side of the fence. Um, <clears throat> but then I think also this idea of then you're reading beyond language and what is poetry and what is language and how can you how can you like configure images as a poetic material? Oh, that's a quote. I guess I missed it. And just to finish on one thought, this is a. Um, I guess I've gone on for a long time. This is a drawing that was made by Galileo Galilei in uh, 1610, and he was mapping the stars. And he was drawing these quite crude maps, but actually very beautiful um, drawings in a sense. If you if you decouple them from their scientific purpose. Um, and I was sort of looking at this material and I saw, came across this, and it really struck me that this is like, it looks like a concrete poem, but it looks like a concrete poem that's made out of emoji, rather than, um, or emoticons, or Unicode, rather than um, the sort of more conventional alphabet. Um, so that, it then sort of struck me that maybe like if there is to be a an emoji poetry, then it's it, it's something that functions in this very nonlinear, multi-directional way. That's really challenging how you read, and and I think this kind of draws us back to the idea of Gomringer's constellation, and the constellation being something that is able to like push us beyond language, and maybe it's quite strict confines, and and maybe it help us sort of read in a in a in a more expanded, less. Um, less binary way. Um, and then that sort of reminded me of um, Martin Wong's painting, paintings. Um, having seen his exhibition at the Bronx Museum currently, 
he, he, he explores language for his paintings in, in lots of ways beyond text. Of course, there's the text and the frame, but he's very interested in sign language, which is, a, uh, which is like a very physical and imagistic form of language that necessarily depends on this materiality of the image and the physical hand to communicate. And he's also very interested in these astrological signs and these, these star signs. Um, and to me, these, these are like this, this realm, this is like some, sort of a metaphor or, or a reality of this realm beyond language, um, which is maybe possible to access through this expanded sense of reading um, <clears throat> that, um, that I think off, off, offers like possibilities for, for language and poetry and um, communication beyond the sort of the, the, the limitations or the confines of, of the technology of the printed page which is what is most often associated, I think, with, with recent history of poetry. So um, I haven't, I guess, like, uh, that I haven't got any more claims to make right now, but maybe we could, this is like also just ideas that can be discussed or, or whatever. Um, and yeah, that's sort of to bring Eugene Gomringer's constellations in a big circle to these other constellations is sort of the loop. Uh, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.